Hello, everyone. This is Martin Willis with the Antique Auction Forum, and welcome to episode number 114 with Caroline Ashley. Today's topic is on wine and appraising and auctioning wine. I appreciate you listening and enjoy today's show. This podcast is sponsored by WorthPoint. Find out what your antiques are worth at worthpoint.com. Hi, everyone. I'm with Caroline Ashley on the line. How are you doing, Caroline? I'm great today, Martin. How about you? Good. And we have a mutual friend, Eric Bradley, antiques trader, that got us hooked up together. Um, Actually, we've been trying to connect for over a year. Is that right? (laughs) I know it's been too long. Yes. Well, here we are. And and, um, I think we both have mutual respect for Eric. He's such a wonderful person in the trade. And uh, I just think he helps grow the business. I I do, too. I bow down to his expertise. And he's a wonderful human being. Uh, So I'm so glad we have that mutual friend. Yes, me too. Well, this is a, a podcast I never thought I would do, and that is uh, today we're going to be talking about wine and uh, one of your specialties. But before we do that, I'd like to ask you, um, I originally knew you as an art appraiser, and I want to ask you how you got started in the business and how young were you when you took interest? Well, no surprise, Martin. I, like many of my colleagues, Probably like you, you know, we grew up in the business, and I have to say I really learned at my parents' knees, I think by osmosis, I Mm -hmm. suppose. They were really avid collectors, and at a very early age, I can remember going to these little country auctions with them, (laughs) and as a little kid, you know, for me it was like theater, watching this cast of characters parade by, you know, these objects and characters, and to me it was... Like I said, it was like theater. So I think I got hooked on this concept very early on. And then, um, and I'm talking five or six years old. So, you know, Mm -hmm. quantum forward. And I became a college student. And then by that time, my parents had retired and they bought this old, um, this old church and they called it Noah's Ark. And when they were visiting me in college, and I was on the East Coast, they would always collect antiques. So they had um, a large supply to stock Noah's Ark with, and I worked there in the summertime. And so I think that kind of put me in good stead for my future career, you know, as an art and antique appraiser, which, as you know, I have done for a number of years and been on Antiques Roadshow and now on HGTV. Um, but that's where it all began. That was all through college. And then I was at that time getting my fine art and education degree. And then subsequent to that, got the advanced certification from NYU in fine and decorative arts and received appraisal certification from the Appraisers Association of America and um, the Appraisal Foundation in Washington, D.C. But I think I was one of the lucky ones in that I knew from an early age what I really wanted to do and what my, you know, how I got my juices flowing, so to speak, and it's served me well, I think, through all these years. So that's how it kind of all began, Martin. Yeah, that's great. And I've heard your name for many years, and I was pretty uh, excited when you said that you would record a podcast with me and for our uh, for our listeners. And so let's roll right into wine. And the first question I have for you is, what sparked your interest in wine to learn how to appraise it? Well, I never knew I was going to appraise wine um, when I first became interested. And mind you, I think that happened when I was probably in my mid-20s. I uh, worked at a five-star French restaurant and um, one of my summer jobs, and I think it was there that I acquired a taste for wine, and I was certainly exposed to a lot of great wines and, um, you know, couldn't always afford to drink them unless someone was buying them for me. (laughs) (laughs) But I then attended cooking classes in France and got to tour some of the vineyards there. And 
you know, I think uh, I've been somewhat of a grape nut ever since. But that's where it all began. And then, um, you know, I got involved in appraising in the, on the art level and antique level and worked at auction houses and so forth, created my own business. But then it became apparent to me at some point in time that there were really very few wine appraisers in the country. Mm. Now, there, I guess I have to qualify that. There are a lot of qualified wine appraisers and sommeliers all over the country, but very interestingly, I think it's a little known fact that there are a lot of certified wine appraisers, and by that I mean individuals who are recognized by professional appraisal organizations uh, who follow USPAP, the Uniform Standards mm -hmm. of Professional Appraisal Practice. Those are almost non-existent, so I saw a need there. And I already had an interest, as you know, so I started taking courses and um, became one of those people who was able to appraise wine and um, do it for the IRS, for insurance purposes. You know, we do our wine appraisals a lot like we do appraisals for any other type of personal property. So basically that means, you know, we do it for divorce or equitable distribution, for insurance purposes, investment, um, estate purposes, damage and loss. So basically we do wine appraisals for the very same reasons or purposes that we do all other personal property appraisals. I see, I see. Now, what should a competent wine appraiser be able to do? Well, I think that it's a two-fold answer. Um, basically, there's two parts of an appraisal, as you know. There's that on-site portion, the intake portion, and then there's the research portion. But as it pertains to appraisers of wine, I think they should be able to, number one, obviously assess the environment. That's very important in a wine appraisal. You have to also be able to interpret the data on a wine label. You have to know how to read it and what it's telling you. Um, it's very important to recognize fakes if they exist, and then also, of course, recognize any condition issues which can affect value. That's the intake or the first part of the appraisal, the on-site part. But the research part, I think basically they should be able to accurately uh, assess available comparables in the marketplace and interpret those comparables, interpret, you know, the markets. Um, and I think just to sum it up, the appraiser should be able to observe the environment, record the fakes, and discuss how they arrived at their report, uh, reported data. Basically, you know, being able to say how they established their value conclusions in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Now, how I talk about fakes an awful lot in this podcast, and I haven't heard any complaints so far, but uh, how can you tell a wine is a fake if they're really good at label reproduction and a similar bottle? How can you tell it's a fake without opening it? What a great question. It's very difficult. It's a very big challenge because, of course, these people are very, very good at it mm. um, and have been doing it for a very long time, interestingly. But it's getting more prevalent. Uh, fraudulent wine and labels are becoming a real problem and have surfaced all over the wine market. And sometimes the only way you can identify them is with um, a black light. And that's why when you go in to do an appraisal in a cellar, you always want to take one. Hmm. Um, but the FBI has identified a number of, of valuable wines with markings that are only legible with black lights. And they've marked them. So if the FBI has identified them and marketed them, in other words, once they take them off the market, they can, they can put special marks on them and then they can be resold. And this is a real problem. Wow. Because, um, it's, it's difficult sometimes to find that and to be able to identify it accurately. But to give you an example, and if you can follow me with this for a second, um, Martin, this is the way it works. Sometimes you can have a wine that is correct, but the vintage is incorrectly reported on the label. 
And by that I mean the deception is that the fake wine labels from the better vintages of the same wine are placed on the bottles of inferior vintages yeah. with the intent to deceive, of course, and to get a higher price for them. And so it's very hard for the layperson to be able to identify these things. So although a lot of wine collectors do their own inventories, it's always good to defer to a professional who can be able to determine a fake, you know, something that is fake from something that isn't. Going back to what you just said a minute ago about the FBI, are you saying that once they discovered there was fake wine, they actually release it out into the market again? Yes, they can take it off the market. They can identify these uh, bottles of wine, and then they can re-release them. Of course, they've marked them in a special way, but it causes a problem. And I don't know if you recall, um, I think it was in the late 80s, this happened with the Salvador Dali art market. Mm -hmm. The FBI found a lot of fake Dalis on the market at that time, took them off the market, marked them, and then... Put them, back, put them right back out there oh. to resell. But I don't understand why these pieces aren't destroyed like they do uh, any other things like fake Rolexes. Would they just destroy them? I don't understand why they're not destroyed. And is it that the government actually wants to receive funds from these confiscated pieces or something? Well, I think in part that's true. You know, these things have value. These dollies and some of these bottles of wine certainly do have value. And perhaps the theory being it's better to garner something from them than to destroy them altogether. Hmm. Unbelievable. But it does create problems for the consumer, problems for the appraisers, etc. I would think so. Uh, now, when you were talking about a black light, um, when you're going into a cellar, uh, what are some other tools that an appraiser needs? Well, you know, like everything, every discipline, you've got your tools of the trade. And I think in looking at a cellar, you know, you have to remember these things. Most wine cellars are rather cold, dark, and sometimes dirty places. So you've got to be prepared for that. And what I usually do, you know, I'll take something warm to wear. I'll take a sweater or a sweatshirt and, you know, help from getting too terribly cold. And, you know, sometimes I'll take an apron just to keep the dirt off my clothes and take a lot of handy wipes. <laughs> I need a flashlight with me because it can be dark. And obviously you're going to take a thermometer and a hydrometer because you've got to measure the temperature, you've got to me measure the humidity. You need a camera. And besides that, probably a tape measure a loop so that you, or a magnifying glass so that you can read the small print on labels. And then finally, of course, a black light for all the reasons we were just talking about. Right, right. Going back to the beginning of us talking about this, when you think of wine cellars and things like that, is the secondary market a real big business? The secondary market is a huge business, and it's becoming even more so. Um, you know, it's always been a big business in Europe and with the new California cult wines, a big business in this country. And now with Hong Kong and the Asian interest, it's just exploding. So um, it's a huge market. And I work with several auction houses, but primarily, as you know, with Heritage. And I think they, in particular, have really set a new standard in wine auctioning. They've set a lot of new records, and I think they have an average sell-through rate of at least 94%. Mm. And that's very high. It is. And I always say, wherever you sell your wine, um, this is a good point to remember. And I think it's, whether it's wine or it's anything, but I always say, if you're a smart collector, be an even smarter consigner. So as a consignment director and a consultant, I help direct that process. Mm -hmm. You know, so I help people sell wine on the secondary market, but it is huge business. Okay, getting back to appraising wine, more or less in a nutshell, what should a competent wine appraiser be able to do? Well, you know, as I mentioned, they really need to be able to 
observe the environment and record the facts and discuss how they arrived at their value conclusions, you know, where they derive their comparables in the marketplace. Um, but I think, interestingly, and I can kind of elaborate on this a minute, but again, this is some of just my personal opinion, um, so we need to put it in that framework of reference. But, you know, I've been an art and antique appraiser for a long time, but I do think, having appraised wine, that there is a bit of a difference. And I would say, I would say that appraising wine is a bit more scientific mm. than appraising paintings or antiques. Um, and I think the reason for that is it's very, very factual. So accordingly, you know, most wine appraisals are written in spreadsheets. We have extensive things that we look for. We put those in spreadsheets. But it's without all that extraneous description of the typical type of fine art or antique appraisal that you do. Um, so I do think it's a little bit more, a little bit more scientific. And I also think that when I'm doing an art or antique appraisal, you know, I'm using my sense of visual aesthetics. Mm -hmm. However, I think with wine appraising, I'm using a sense of, of course, sight, that's visual, but also touch and smell and taste. And taste, that's the thing I, I uh, linger on because although um, a wine appraiser is not required to taste when performing a wine appraisal, in fact, it's discouraged. Um, but if somebody were to offer it to me, I think a good bottle of 1982 Margot would be really hard to resist. <laughs> now, uh, this, this, this just brings up a question to mind. So if you have, if you're doing a wine appraisal and there are several of the same vintage, now pardon my layman terms, but in a rack in a cellar, and you want to make sure that it is a good vintage, do you actually taste test one of the bottles? Well, you know, according to USPAP regulations, you're really not allowed to do that. You're not supposed to drink on the job. <laughs> <laughs> Darn those use PAP regulations. That's right? pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but off the record, um, when you're not, when you're not appraising, if you're with your client and you're in the wine cellar and you finished your wine appraising job and you take your wine appraisal hat off and you become, you know, uh, in a social situation, then, of course, you can taste it. You know, I think that, did I answer your question? I'm not sure. Yeah, well, the question was based on, whether to make sure the vintage was actually what it is supposed to be, like to say if there's a large collection of one vintage. What I'm trying to understand is if you're appraising wine, are all the facts available from the label and the condition, or mm -hmm. do you actually need to taste the wine? What a great question, Martin. I mean, I think you really zeroed in on something that is, is hugely important. Um, and I'll, I'll explain in detail. When we do a wine appraisal, you know, we look for certain things. In our spreadsheets, I'll tell you what we look for. We basically, and clients can put these in, in spreadsheets, but always the appraiser has to do a physical inspection and sometimes a taste inspection. We look for the vintage. And we look for, of course, the name of the wine, the location of the vineyard, um, any special qualities like Reserva or special labels or limited editions. You want to know who the producer was, what's the size of the bottle. Um, I'm thinking the quantity, the condition of the bottle, and, I mean, whether the bottle has pop corked. Uh, a pop cork or a worn seal or a stained label. You want to see the color of the wine and, of course, the price of the wine. The one thing I forgot was called, something called eulage, which is spelled U-L-L-A-G-E, eulage, which is the amount of wine that's evaporated out of the bottle. Now, these are all things that we can do from a visual, physical inspection. However, where it becomes, where it becomes tricky is that the value of the wine greatly depends upon storage conditions over time. So the appraiser really cannot verify that, in a, that the wine that she's appraising has always been optimally stored 
Mm. She has to assume, if she doesn't taste it, that it has been stored in a comparable condition as when it's being examined. However, the appraiser is not responsible if the wine has been incorrectly stored in the past or in the future because those are things we cannot control. So what I'm getting to is this. After you do your physical inspection, you do your visual inspection, if you then taste the wine, if you have some reason to suspect there could be something uh, compromised about it by observation and you taste it, the taste part of that equation is what may verify whether it's retained its value or it hasn't. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, I've sold wine in the past in California at auction and always got these calls about people asking the condition of the cork and how the shoulders were as far as the liquid in the bottle, how high it was. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other things? What about, I've seen wine also that had like sediment in it. And mm -hmm. what, about, what about things like that? What are some other things you look for as well? Sure. And this is so important as an auctioneer for you to know um, and for buyers to know. These are good questions to ask auctioneers. These are good questions to ask dealers, appraisers. The reason we, we pay so much attention to the cork is because you want to, in, the reason we want our wine to be stored on its side is that we want to keep the cork moist and wet. And the reason for that is because if the cork dries out, then the wine can evaporate from the bottle. Mm. So that's one of the reasons people are so interested in making sure that the cork is intact and it hasn't popped. Now, when people ask you about um, the shoulder, it, usually what they're asking for is... Um, I think they they really want to know if the wine has a fill below the midpoint, meaning the midpoint of the shoulder, and the shoulder is just below the neck of the bottle. And this can be a good indicator of poor storage conditions and or undrinkable wine, so that if it's evaporated, it's going to be beneath the shoulder. So that's an important question to be able to answer as well. Mm -hmm. And then I had one more question there. You asked about the cork. Oh, I think you asked about sediment. Right, sediment. It's one of the reasons, again, why we like to keep things stored in an environment where things are not moved around a lot. And, of course, we can't control that in earthquake-prone zones mm -hmm. or areas, but it disturbs the sediment, and we, we want to keep the sediment um, as undisturbed as possible. So that's the reason why you don't want a lot of disruption uh, with moving wine about. Uh, sometimes, of course, collections have to be moved, and when they have to be moved, you know, there are ways in which you can have that done so that it protects wine from as much disruption as possible. Uh, I see. Is it moved on, like to say if it's going to auction and it's being taken out of a cellar, is it moved on the same side it's been stored on and caref so as not to disturb the sediment? Right. It's, when, it's, when it travels, it's supposed to be, of course, um, put on its side, not straight up, but it's supposed to be on its side. It's supposed to travel in an environment where basically it's around 55 to 60 degrees. The environment, you know, should be pretty stable and the humidity should be pretty stable, 65 to 70 percent. And there are trucks that are used that um, keep those conditions stable. And also, just as um, a side, it's preferable to move wine if you have to in the fall and in the spring so that it's, it's not either too cold or too hot when you move it. But there are lots of things we like to keep in place so we protect the wine in transit. How about when it's being shipped from, say, if someone buys a very fine wine in Europe and they buy it in the United States, how could that possibly be shipped without any interference in that? Well, you know, that is a science. 
And there are people who, you know, insure the wine. It's basically insured in transit. So they go to very extreme measures to keep that wine protected. And, um, you know, it's, it's probably not unlike thinking about shipping um, something perishable like a lobster or something like that mm-hmm. over a long distance. You know, there's things, there's technology involved and there's insurance policies involved to make sure that this is done correctly. Great. I have a couple of um, questions of more about investing and things like that. But um, just out of interest, the thought came to me, do you happen to know what the world record for a bottle of wine is at auction? Well, you know, these records always change. Yeah. And as soon as I say this, of course, <laughs> it'll change. But let me tell you what I know. There is um, There were a couple that came up in 2011. And one is a cognac. Now, cognac is a kind of brandy, and it's distilled from wine, so it still falls within the wine category of sorts. And it was sold... Um, it was sold in 20, I think it was a 153-year-old bottle that was also, interestingly, um, encrusted with diamonds and gold, mm-hmm. and it sold in Paris, and it sold for $156,000, actually one fifty six seven forty. so $156,740. So to my knowledge, that was one of the most expensive things to sell. Now, what now do you think, how do you think the bottle itself, when you say it was encrusted with gold, uh, what do you think that affected in the value? Do you have any idea on that? Well, I think that was just the aesthetics of it. I don't think it – I think the wine is what – brought it up to that level because of its rarity. I think that, uh, you know, the gold and diamonds just added to the panache. Uh-huh. Wow. <laughs> I would say it was, um, it sold on its own merit as wine primarily. But the other answer to the question is um, Penfolds, which is a company in Australia that you may know, and they have a bottle that they're selling. They haven't sold it yet, but they say that it's selling for $168,000. It's a cab. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, assuming it does sell, that will be the record. You know, it will be 168. So wow. we'll go from 156 to $168,000. Now, what kind of celebration would you have to have to open that bottle? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I can think of a lot. <laughs> I can pick one up right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy, it better taste good. Uh, I'll tell you, it could be you know. A, I could say, let's raise a glass to another wonderful podcast. Oh, How about hey, that? <laughs> uh, I'm I'm up for that. Uh, and along those lines, what would you consider the most valuable wine in today's world? Is it a vintage or is it, you know, a certain vineyard? Well, you know, again, this is always personal. Ah, mm -hmm. Can I answer it from a personal perspective? Yes, that's fine. Well, of course, I've got to divide it into red and white as well. Um, I would say that my favorite red is a Chateau Margaux, which is a Burgundy, and it's one of the oldest wines in France, actually from the 15th century, so it's been very carefully cultivated over the years, and it's absolutely superlative. So I'd have to say, you know, that that's probably one of my, if not my, favorite red. I said this before, and I'll say it again. My favorite white, if I could get someone to buy it for me, (laughs) because I could never buy it for myself, would be a Chateau de Kim, and that's I'll spell it for you. It's C H A T E A U and D apostrophe, excuse me, Y Q U E M. A bottle of that sold in 2011 for $117,000. Thank goodness. Which is the most expensive white wine sold to date. But since I don't think I'm going to find anyone to pony up to buy <laughs> that for me to taste time soon, I think that. I could just settle for, you know, a wonderful Montrachat um, from 2008 or nine because I love that, you know, for its rich taste and its great aroma. So those are a few of my ideas. So if you were to give advice to someone that was interested in investing 
in wine, and I'm assuming it's an investment. Uh, where would they begin? Well, you know, I always think it's good to have great advisors, but basically investing is in wine, you know, again, there's no great science to this. There's mm-hmm. no great secret to this. It's like any other commodity. Um, people ask me that about art all the time. They ask me that about wine all the time. But investing in wine or art is no different than investing in stock. So, you know, if you buy the right object or the right wine at the right time, it's going to go up in value. And if you miss the mark, uh, either buying or selling, it'll go down. So it's sort of like Paul Samuelson Economics 101. So it's pretty basic. But that's where the advisor comes into play. If you can get someone to help advise you about investing, um, that's always very helpful. That can go a long way. Mm -hmm. Getting back to what we were talking about earlier a little bit, what, what matters most about a wine, if it's from a noted vineyard or in a region where there was a very good year vintage, what is the most important thing? Well, you know, it's, they're both important. They're both really very important. Um, and I think what you're really talking about is something that in the industry they refer to as T-E-R-R-O-I-R, and it's pronounced terroir. And it's a combination of these natural factors, and they exist all around the globe. Um, but these factors include, as it pertains to wine and wine growing, the topsoil, the climate, which includes, you know, the rain, the sun, the wind, the slope of the hill, and the, even the altitude. And it's this unique combination of these natural factors that any particular vineyard has. And believe it or not, these can vary from one side of a hill to the other. Wow. So it's very subtle. It's very nuanced. But um, these things really come into play when we're talking about a great year or a great wine or a great vineyard because you can have one and not the other, and you can have both. So it, it's dependent upon a lot of things we can control, a lot of things we can't control. Now, is there? this may be kind of an odd question. Is there ever a fluke where a vineyard, like an unknown vineyard or a little-known vineyard, all of a sudden has, like, a really good crop and has a really good vintage of wine? Oh, absolutely. Yes, because, you know, this is an art, and there are so many very um, astute winemakers, you know, people who have learned, learned this trade through generations of time. You know, they've apprenticed for centuries. I mean, it goes through families. And so you can have some very, very skilled winemakers who can, um, you know, perhaps go to a new, I'm just saying something hypothetical here, but who could go to a new area and let's say um, take a wine from Europe and bring it to Australia and create conditions or plant those vines in conditions that are optimal. And because of their winemaking skills, could create a very fine wine that would be very highly revered, highly regarded in the marketplace. So, yes, that can happen. It does happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is another, I would consider this an oddball question I'm throwing at you. Um, In today's world, new wines that are, uh, are being harvested currently, does insecticide ever come up in affecting a vintage? That's a really odd question, I know. (laughs) It does. It absolutely does. Um, You know, insects can attack the vine. Insects can attack the grape. And um, it's, it's a little controversial because a lot of vineyards really pride themselves on the fact that they don't use insecticides. And um, the ones that are used, of course, are um, supposedly all right, you know, to use and don't cause any types of effect on the human body. However, um, insecticides are, are something that 
is a bit controversial and more, I, mean, I should say rather less is more, the less insecticide used, the better. Um, but, you know, insects are always going to be around and they're always going to have to be with in some manner or other. But um, it's, certainly a, it's certainly an important question and a very controversial one. Yes. A lot of times people think that things have to be old to be valuable in, say, the auction business or antique business or, you know, alike. Um, are there vintages that are very recent that are valuable? Yes, there are. Um, and an interesting note here, just as an aside, is that only a relatively small percentage of wine is old that is valuable. Now, let me explain that further. Certain types of Bordeaux and certain Rieslings have proven their ability to increase in value without deteriorating over time. So, you know, sometimes that can go as far back as 100 years. I had an opportunity once to taste an 1870, I think it was 1870 Chateau Lafitte Rothschild. Um, but generally speaking, older is not always better. So I think there's a misconception sometimes with lay people that a wine has to be very, very old and uh, very mature in order to be good. But that's not necessarily true. That's only for a very small percentage of wine. Hmm. That's really interesting. That really improves greatly with age. Uh-huh. Uh, there are some exceptions, and the one I just mentioned is a perfect example of an exception. Mm-hmm. Now, for someone that is more or less a novice, um, do you have good resources or books that you can recommend? Well, I have, you know, an extensive list of books, but I'm going to, just for the sake of, um, you know, some brevity here, I'm going to give you a resource, the idea of um, uh, one book. I'm trying to distill it down into one now. There's so much out there, but I think that an all-around good resource is, if you can believe it, a book called Wine All in One for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't dumb down wine at all. It's just that it includes so many, so many parts of the equation. And I'll give you an example. This book goes through a thorough description of wines. It covers prominent winemaking countries, and it gives details on wines from around the world, which is, is wonderful. I love the fact that it also gives you these delightful food pairings and suggestions, and it gives tips for how to become a wiser wine drinker and buyer. So whether you're a novice or whether you're a connoisseur, there's something you can learn from this particular book, and it's also available on ebook, by the way. So if you're traveling and you want to... Um, check something out or you want to refresh your memory or educate yourself about something in particular, it's a great book to take with you in ebook version too. Wow, that's great. Well, we're out of time here. Um, just a, one more question here. Do you offer your services nationwide, basically, for appraising wine? I do. I, you know, I have a website, um, Martin, and I'm always trying to refine it, trying to put lots of great, interesting tidbits in there and blog about wonderful ideas and new things in the marketplace and auctions, by the way. But it also gives information about my services. I do make on-site appraisal and consultation services all over the United States, and I do consign wine at auction. And that's accessible at auctionyourwine.com. And email is info at auctionyourwine.com. That's all one word, auctionyourwine.com. There's great information in there that's educational as well as interesting. So whether you need my services or you just want to access a site that has good information in it, I invite people to come check it out. That's wonderful. Great. Um, so you've been, you know, I just learned so much about wine that I had no idea about, and I don't even drink. <laughs> Well, did I wet your taste buds a little? <laughs> You're making me think about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's been a blast. And as I say, let's raise a glass to another great podcast. All right. <laughs>
So this is Martin Willis with Caroline Ashley, and we're signing off. This podcast is sponsored by WorthPoint. Find out what your antiques are worth at worthpoint.com.